Good morning, Cornerstone Alliance Online Church. My name is Joel and I am the lead pastor here. Welcome to our service this morning. Today, as we were meeting, as we were earlier in the year, we are all meeting online as our building is closed for now, but our church is not closed. We have just closed down and and paused our in-person services. So we're all joining together here on the same uh, venue. So after the service, we are reopening our virtual lobby. We would love for you to join us afterwards and just talk and hang out and get caught up with each other for a few minutes. The link will be in, in, in the chat box and also in the notes at the end of the service. Also, this is almost halfway through November. And so in a few more weeks, it will be the beginning of Advent. And this year for um, part of our celebration, we want to do a Christmas pageant. A Christmas pageant, usually um, often, usually or often the children will, be, will come up on stage and there'll be a sheep and maybe someone holding a star and we'll have the wise men come. And, and even though the wise men don't really come into the story till later, we have them all up on the stage with Mary and Joseph. And so this year, we want to do a virtual um, nativity pageant, not just for children, but for everyone. We'll need about 20 people. And you will record your part at home on your phone or on your computer and send it in. And then we will put it together. And it'll be kind of like everyone on Zoom, our virtual Christmas pageant. So please, if you would like to be part of that, let us know. Send an email to office at cornerstonealliance.ca so we can get you involved. Well, let us begin, and I want to remind you of the words of Jesus when he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come, let us join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus. Thank you for providing everything that we need. Thank you for taking the initiative and showing us your love. And I pray that this morning as we gather together in our different places, you would bind us together through your Spirit, as one body, bring unity to this, this group of believers and brothers and sisters, and fill us with your spirit this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. By the power of his voice, he calls the winds to still. By the power of his love, our sins have been forgotten. By the power alive in us, we stand forever free. From dead to life, you overcome the weight of all.
Hi Cornerstone, I'm here to introduce our Angel Tree Christmas program for 2020. This is a program run by Prison Fellowship where inmates apply through their chaplain for their children to get Christmas gifts delivered to the family on their behalf. And then we recruit loving sponsors who go out and buy a $35 gift, deliver it to the home so that the child realizes that they are remembered at Christmas time. Now Cornerstone has generously put a goal of 35 children this year. So so this is your invitation to come and sponsor a child. If you go to cornerstonealliance.church, there are four options. The first is to sponsor a child, so you go and you purchase the gift, wrap it and deliver it yourself. Second option, if you just want to contribute money to cover the 35 gifts, you can do that as well. Third option, if you love shopping with someone else's money, sign up for this one. You can spend the day at a toy store and get the gifts that have been paid for. Or the fourth option, if you have some free days in December and can offer your services driving gifts around to the homes, you can sign up as a delivery person. So we encourage you today to get involved. Just go to the website, check on your option that you prefer, and let's bring a joyful Christmas to an inmate's child this year. We're going to play a little video to introduce the program. People who are incarcerated are just simply broken people. But the truth be told, everyone who walks through the doors of our church, ourselves included, we're broken people. And the call of Christ is go and to heal the brokenhearted. It's an amazing opportunity to meet people who in many ways haven't been given a chance in life and it's our being able to offer a hand of friendship to people that other folks wouldn't want to. And even if I can't know them directly, I can pray, and my prayer is that they be touched by the love of God. So that's a wonderful opportunity. So our vision at, um, at Prison Fellowship is to be a community of reconciliation, and, and that is among um, offenders, among ex-offenders, their families. The role that Angel Tree plays in that is um, having a child kept in contact with a, with a parent and, and keeping that connection going, and sometimes even more so having the church um, community connected into, uh, into that gives a child a different a different path. And so they'll write down the child's name, contact possibly another parent or a grandparent, and something they think their child would like for Christmas. Sometimes shortly before Christmas, people in the community would uh, take a wrapped gift to that child. It will have a, a gift tag from, from mom or dad on it and a message to that, uh, to that child. And oh, the expression on the child's face. You remembered me, dad remembered me, mom remembered me. The neat thing about Angel Tree Christmas is it allows you to have the personal contact to possibly make a relationship with someone. And maybe there won't come. Maybe it's just the, the first planted seed that a church cares enough to do something for this family. And if we really believe that the gospel can change lives, if we really do, then what could be more rewarding than to see God dramatically change the life of somebody that the rest of the world would write off? Unexplainable lie, I can hardly think as you call. So we're sponsoring 35 kids this year, and every time we get a sponsor, we're going to hang an angel on the tree. So we invite you to sign up today. When I was first introduced to this church, I was being interviewed by the interviewing committee, and one of the questions was asked by someone named Mark, and he asked me, am I a Star Wars person or a Star Trek person? And I froze, because I thought, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I know Mark better now, so I would know what he was looking for, and I know how to answer it, but I was afraid if I answered the wrong way, maybe, you know, I'm considered an outsider. Star Wars or Star Trek? You know, these are some kinds of, uh, sometimes these are fun questions that we ask people, you know, are you a cat person or a dog person? Because rarely is someone a cat and dog person. 
So are you a cat person? Are you a dog person? Oh, okay, now I see what kind of person you are. So these are fun games, but sometimes they can be quite serious and they can actually cause divisions among us. So for example, do you vote a um, progressive, conservative, or are you a liberal? And then we can pigeonhole people, oh, you're that kind of person. Or have you ever um, found, you know, people ask, are you a second child? Oh, you're a third, oh, you're an only child. Oh, okay, now I understand. It kind of makes you feel like you've been um, maybe put out a little bit. And that now there's a, there's a, there's kind of a, not really a wall, but it's kind of a barrier, you know, so sometimes these can be quite divisive. And as you know, there's a lot of anger out there in the world today. And people seem to be angry about something all the time. Someone's angry about something all the time on your newsfeed, in your social media, or just in the newspaper, or on TV shows. Have you ever heard of Godwin's Law? This is Godwin's Law. You may not have heard of it, but when I describe it to you, you're gonna, you'll know what it is. Apparently, this is what it is. A Godwin's Law is this um, internet saying, and uh, it goes like this. As an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one. In other words, if an online discussion, regardless of the topic or scope, it can be something like, are you a Star Wars or Star Trek fan? Or it could be something political. If an online discussion goes on long enough, sooner or later, someone will compare someone or something to Adolf Hitler or the Nazis, at which point the conversation just ends. Have you experienced something like that? It's like the longer these discussions go, the angrier somebody gets. And yet, the church isn't all that different. There are often divisions and, and angry conversations that happen even within Christ's body, even within the same local church. Or maybe sometimes you, you find out someone at work or someone on your street that they also go to church. You're like, oh, you go to church too. And often the next question is, well, which, which church do you go to? And they, and they might say, oh, I go to uh, the United Church, or I go to Springs. And then immediately we think, oh, okay. Or we might think, oh, you're that kind of Christian. It's easy for us to, to define ourselves a certain way and then to be able to define others a different way. But here's something that we want to, I want to talk about today. And I'm going to bring you in a little bit of um, pastor's inside scoop here. Um, of course, we've all been going through upheaval over the last several months. But according to a recent poll, uh, when asked the most significant struggle in this moment that pastors are facing, do you know what mo many pastors said? They said disunity in their congregation was the most pressing struggle. So think about that for a minute. Okay, we are dealing with a once in a lifetime pandemic that has changed completely how we pastor. It has probably changed completely how you do work as well. How we do church is completely changed. And yet in the midst of all this upheaval, many pastors are saying that their number one concern is unity in their own congregation. What is causing all this division? Do, do you, can you, can you feel this too? Do, do you, do you think it, does this ring true for you? What do you think causes all this division within the body of Christ. I mean, just with the coronavirus, there are so many different viewpoints, right? Some people think it's a hoax, and some people are scared to death to even walk outside of their own bedroom. So there's, there's a lot of different opinions. But really, uh, the church has been like this since day one. I mean, not since day one of creation. The church came into existence on the day of Pentecost. So ever since the church has been in existence, there have been divisions and disagreements within the church. Just read Acts and find out all of the divisions and quarrels that they had or any of the epistles that Paul wrote to the early churches. There were arguments and there were divisions. Or they've always been there. But it seems like the coronavirus over this season has just exposed, maybe brought to the surface, some of the issues that have always been there. Christians have always disagreed on different parts, uh, have always disagreed on, on certain things. So this is not new. And Jesus knew that unity among Christians would be of crucial importance. Before he was crucified on the cross, Jesus was praying in John, John chapter 17. And you don't have to open up there. I'm just going to read very, very, you can, John 17, chapter 20, but let me just read this for you. <clears throat> Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. He, he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me 
through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me even as I, uh, that you loved. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The unity of Christians, the unity of the church is closely tied uh, to that unity between Jesus and his heavenly father. It is a witness, it is a sign of that unity, but so often churches and Christians aren't known you know, by outsiders, they're not known for their unity, but maybe they're known for their anger or, or the way they, they, they act in the political realm. You know, there was a big election in, in the United States this past week, and, and um, it, it didn't really matter what, what the outcome was. There, there was a fallout. I knew there was going to be a fallout either way. Because before, I heard prominent Christian leaders uh, in the United States saying, you know, if you're voting this way, then you are of the devil. And then other prominent Christian leaders of big churches said, well, there, no Christian can possibly vote that way. And I, when I hear these things, I think, how are they ever going to live with each other after the fact? And then I, wish, then I think, well, I hope it just stays. I hope other people don't hear how these people are talking to each other. But these are articles from the Washington Post and New York Times and even the Globe and Mail. And so this kind of attitude isn't only in one country, it's also here in our country. I heard recently about a story of a church in Ontario whose youth pastor had posted things online in support of one of the presidential nominees in the United States. And because of that, some families left the church and now there's discipline procedures going on. It's just, there's just anger everywhere. So I understand or I can see why Jesus thought this was a very important prayer for him to pray, a prayer for unity, because our unity is a testimony to the relationship that God has, the Father has with his Son. And this is how the world will know about our love. So I want to talk about this. There's a, a certain story in the Old Testament, and we're, we're, we're talking about Bible stories for grown-ups, and we're going to come to that in a minute. You can open your Bibles if you want to Judges chapter 12, and then we'll come back in just a minute to look at that story. Please join me and read scripture out loud together. Psalm 113 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? The one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes. With the princes of his people, he settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. 
praise the Lord. Psalm 113. Hey, thanks for reading along with that Bible verse. It, it's, it makes us feel like we're all together when we know in other people's homes, they're also reading uh, along. And in that video, what COVID-19 taught me, those are some good answers, weren't they? But I'll bet you have some answers. I'll bet you thought of some things that COVID-19 has taught you. And so I'd love to hear those right now. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to get ready for the next part here. And as I, I'm doing that, I, could you just chat on the side here and answer that question for you? What, has you, what have you learned from COVID-19 or what has COVID-19 taught me? So just, um, just for uh, like 30 seconds as I get ready, go ahead and chat uh, in the chat box right here. Okay, wonderful. Those were some awesome answers. Uh, we can learn lessons uh, at any time, uh, can't we? Even during a pandemic. Hey, so if you have your Bibles open to Judges chapter 12, we'll, we'll, we'll go and look at that story uh, right now. And um, I just want to uh, begin by, by mentioning there's, um, that we're in an age of outrage. And there's uh, recently a book was written called Christians in an Age of Outrage. And even just just the fact that a book like that needed to be written tells us something about the kind of society and, and what we've come to these days. So in, one, in this book, one of the, the lines says this, it says, one of the most startling and disconcerting features of our age is how outrage tends to build slowly mounting into wave and then counter wave and then counter counter wave that consume everything uh, in their path. What starts off as an innocent mistake or a meaningless joke can quickly be turned into a national debate about something profound, moral, theological, or something cultural. I'm sure you've witnessed something like that as well, especially when it's online. But even not online, you just mention something casually, and then it turns into something just so much bigger. We're in this age of outrage. Something small starts out really big. Well, let's look at um, Judges chapter 12, and we'll start in verses 1. This, um, this story I've entitled, A Murderous Shibboleth from Judges chapter 12. And you'll see exactly what this title means shortly if you haven't figured it out already. So let's look at Judges chapter 12 and we'll start verse 1. It says, The Ephraim, Ephraimet forces uh, were called out and they crossed over to Zaphon. They said to Jephthah, Hey, why did you go to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn down your house over your head. <laughs> I mean, obviously there's some details missing here, but it's just, sometimes it's humorous. I mean, it's not funny, it's, it's serious, but it's sometimes it's kind of humorous, I think, you know, how scripture describes things. It's like, hey, why, why, why didn't you ask us to come fight, fight with you? Now we're gonna burn down your house, you know, over your head. And obviously not meaning like a building house, but like your, like your, your land or your, your whole clan or your whole tribe. So. Man, that was, uh, it escalated quickly, didn't it? So this is uh, the judge. His name is Jephthah. And uh, there's these Ephraimite forces. Um, we're called it, they crossed over to Zaphon. Okay, so just before this, uh, Jephthah, okay, who is a Gileadite, he, his army had uh, conquered these Ammonites. And uh, the Lord gave them victory. So the Ephraimites... Who, they, these are all Israelites. They're, it's all from the people of God. This isn't like, you'll see, this is a matter of infighting shortly. This isn't uh, like the Canaanites fighting the Israelites or, or, or idol worshipers. This is within the people of God. This is within the people of Israel. So, um, so they, they were, you know, brother tribes. So the Ephraimites are like, hey, why didn't you, you know, we could have helped you. Why are you excluding us? 
And then they said to Jephthah, well, why is it, well, now we're going to burn down your house. So verse 2, Jephthah answered, well, I and my people, right, you know, we were engaged in a great struggle with the Ammonites. And although I called you, you didn't save me out of their hands. So, you know, he, he's saying he, maybe he called, maybe he didn't call, but either way, I, you didn't save me out of their hands. So when I saw that you wouldn't help, I took my life in my hands and crossed over to fight the Ammonites. And it's important to note this. He says, and the Lord gave me the victory over them. Now, why have you come up today to fight me? Let's just, just quickly recap here. Okay, so Jephthah had gone over to, to fight the Ammonites. The Lord gave him the victory over them. And then the Ephraimites were kind of upset that they weren't included. And um, Jephthah said, well, I did ask you, but you never came to help. So, and, then, and now the Ephraimites are coming to fight them because they were excluded the first time. And so Jephthah says, now, why have you come up today to fight me? So then Jephthah then called together the men of Gilead, okay, and fought against Ephraim. The Gileadites struck them down because the Ephraimites had said, oh, you Gileadites are renegades from Ephraim and Manasseh. So these are lots of you know, people's tribal names. Let's just stop for a second. You remember the story of, of Joseph? Or we could even go back further. Uh, the, the God called Abraham. And he wanted to bless Abraham so that the, he could be a blessing to all nations. And then uh, we, we come down to you know, Abraham and then Isaac and then, and then Jacob. And then we have the 12 uh, sons, which become the 12 tribes of, of Israel. And Joseph was, was one of these 12. And his father loved him very much, maybe even more than the others. So they were jealous of him. And then in the end, you know, they were separated for a while and they all came back together. And this group of people became the Israelites. So there's these 12 tribes coming from all the, the 12 different sons. The, the tribe of Levi was set aside uh, for priestly duties, so they weren't given land. But Joseph, for some reason, he was given double the land. And so there was Ephraim and Manasseh, kind of like Joseph got two portions of land. His, it, was, it was kind of double. And, and so there's these 12 tribes. So they're saying, you know, you Gileadites, you're not really Israel. You're renegades, okay, from Ephraim and Manasseh. They're, they're name calling them here. So that was why um, they, the Ephraimites, um, the Gileadites struck them down because the Ephraimites had called them names, so they're retaliating. Okay, they struck them down. Verse 5 The Gileadites, this is Jephthah's group, captured the fords of the Jordan leading to Ephraim. And whenever a survivor of Ephraim said, Let me cross over, because they wanted to go back home. Right? They, they had to cross the river to get back home. But the Gileadites had, had captured this area. So they had to get past them. So whenever a survivor Ephraim said, let me cross over, the man of Gilead asked him, are you an Ephraimite? And, and if he replied, no, no, I'm not. Right? So you don't have to kill me. I'm not an Ephraimite. I'm not an Ephraimite. They said, all right, prove it. Okay. All right, say Shibboleth. And then if he said Sibboleth, because he could not pronounce the word correctly because of their dialect or their accent, then they knew, ha, you're lying. You are an Ephraimite. So if they, if they couldn't say Shibboleth, they could only say Sibboleth, they could, because they couldn't pronounce the word correctly, they seized him and killed him at the fords of the Jordan. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Boy, that's, uh, that's pretty crazy. And then let's just finish this section. Jephthah, Jephthah led Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite, Gileadite died and was buried in a town in Gilead. So this is the story of the murderous Shibboleth. And I want you to note that these are two tribes of people of Israel. These, these are supposed to be one big family, and yet this infighting occurs. And the way that they're able to determine who's, you know, who's, who's part of us and, and who's, who's them, there's an us versus them, is this Shibboleth. And if they pronounce it Sibboleth, they said, well, they, they were killed. This word, you may have heard it used, it's used in, in their English language to, to, to describe 
this, this is the origin of the word, but the word is to describe a kind of a boundary marker. If there's something that distinguishes someone, like, okay, you're not one of us because you can't pronounce this word shibboleth, or you're not one of us because, you know, you go to a different kind of church, or you're not one of us because you voted for that person not this person, or you're not one of us because you like Star Trek, you know, we like Star Wars. I mean, that's kind of a funny example, but, but it can be quite serious. So even today, even within the people of God, there is infighting, believe it or not. This is why many pastors today are concerned about the unity in their congregation. And we have our own shibboleths. We have things that, that, that just, oh, now you've gone too far. You've crossed that line. There are many contentious issues uh, within, uh, within our, 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 our thinking and, and our beliefs. And for some people, it's this. For some people, it might be something else. And so sometimes, you know, I'll get phone calls or emails from people checking out churches. Maybe they've moved to Windsor Park recently and they're looking for a church nearby or for whatever reason they find us online and they want to find out more about the church before coming in. And they'll often ask questions. About, about our beliefs or, or about my beliefs as the pastor. And, and I, I can direct them to our website where there's a link to the statement of faith, but, but they want to know, you know what, what do you think about this issue or about this issue? Because they, they have in their minds, so, uh, like, they want to know where I stand and if I'm part of you know, the same group. And the way I answer questions will tell them that kind of thing. But this happens even with, within our church and even in our own denomination. There are differences. There is diversity and that's why it's so beautiful. We've talked about this before because it's, it's, it's a case that is recent. In our denomination, we, we don't take a stand on uh, whether women can be teaching or preaching or, or anything. We, we allow each church and each worker to make up their own mind. Our denomination has decided this is not something that is essential. And so for the sake of mission, for the sake of reaching the world, this one, we're just going to say, you, you there's biblical reasons for both sides, and we'll let you decide. That's just an example. I often bring it up because it's a current example, but there are other things too. And often when people have decided that they disagree and, and they've put up a shibboleth to put me on the outside, it, it's never an essential issue. It's never, you know, is the Bible authoritative? Or is Jesus the Son of God? Or is Jesus the only way to salvation? It's not these core things about the gospel. It's always these other things that are these outer rings where we need to have diversity, but it's not on this central target. And so this is what I wanted to, to talk about. We, we need to hold to these core central beliefs and allow some of these other things to, to not act as shibboleths in our own lives. So some shibboleths might be uh, whether people drink alcohol or how they raise their children or, you know, the, the women in ministry issue or, or for, for some believers, it's, um, it's a sexuality issues. And so we've determined that this is good enough, but once you cross this line, you've gone too far. And so Jesus prays before he's, he's hung on the cross. He prays for unity. He prays that we would all come together because this is how God's love is shown to us. And so I think last week, um, we talked about the Reformation because it was Reformation Sunday. And our guest speaker said, you know, we're reformed and always reforming. And remember, he referred to Marie Kondo, who loves to, to get rid of clutter. And over the years, we build up clutter. And some of this clutter becomes very central to, to our belief system, but they never should have been central. And so we need to declutter a little bit. And for some of you, this, this core beliefs that, that w where we do not compromise on it's become too large and you need to declutter a little bit. Maybe for some people it's too small and so you need to a little bit bigger, but if, if this core becomes too large, you're gonna run into too many problems and pretty soon you won't fit in any church. So I want to encourage you to always be reforming and, and we'll get to this in the next section here as we, we look closely at what these core issues might be. Do you remember a while ago there was, I, I, I made a picture of a dartboard I said, here's, here's the bullseye. This bullseye is, is the gospel. This bullseye is like, the, Jesus is the only way to God. You know, for example, Jesus is God. Jesus is, is fully man. He's fully God. There's a core belief. So on the outside beliefs, these are the things that, that aren't, they don't change the gospel. But each denomination might think 
think, well, we, yes, we have the, the core beliefs, but also if, you know, a few other things that we'd like to include, not in the gospel, but we like to live by, and, and these two, but it's the same dartboard. We're still one family. So let's talk about this a little bit in this next section. So just watch this video. It's uh, coming from Ephesians chapter 4. And here's, here's a simple way for us to um, just be nice to each other in the midst of our diversity, and then we'll get a little deeper after that. Have you ever heard of the robber's cave experiment? I like reading about these experiments and, and sometimes afterwards I wonder about the ethics of it. All but we'll just put that aside because we learned something from these, this experiment. In particular, the robber's cave experiment. This was um, an experiment um, that, was, um, that took two groups of um, grade five boys. They were all the same age, roughly the same socioeconomic background. So 22, a group of 22 boys, and they went out to um, a summer camp. And then when they got to the summer camp, they were separated into two groups of 11. So there was uh, one cabin of 11 with a counselor and then another cabin. And they were far enough away that they didn't really see each other or hear each other. And they, were, they had their own um, beach areas to play and their own you know, sports areas. And, um, and so they, they basically hung out um, in their own group. Uh, for the first week, and they, they ended up creating some you know identity and camaraderie, and it was uh, they had names I forget I mean it was like the eagles and then the rattlesnakes or something so they they had they formed this identity, and then uh, in the second week they were allowed to mingle a little bit with each other, and it came to the point where they both wanted to use um, the baseball diamond. There was one baseball diamond they both wanted to use it, and so they had to they they started name calling, and and kind of picking on each other. And, and, and then as things escalated, and then pretty soon they, they had plans to um, have a fist fight, and there were st sticks and like socks with rocks, you know, and they, it had to be broken up um, by, the, um, by, by, the, the, by the counselors, or it would have gotten much worse. And then in the third week of the experiment, they were, um, they were forced to eat together. Uh, they, had to have, they had to do some activities together. They watched movies together, but still they would not associate. They would not, um, they're still name calling. They wouldn't really mingle with the other group. And so then finally, near the end of the experiment, um, this was all arranged by, uh, by the experimenters. Um, the water supply needed to be fixed. And the only way they could fix this blocked water supply was by working together. And if they did not work together, they couldn't have water. And they couldn't, there's so many things that they couldn't, so they were forced to work together. And then they kept eating together and they were forced to to, create, to make their meals together, and they were forced to do things together. So by the end, um, the walls had broken down and they had come um, to be as one group of, of 22 boys. So what does this experiment prove to us? There's many different lessons. Some people would say that uh, basically this proves that tribalism is just a part of life. It's inescapable, and there's always going to be tribes. So get used to it. Others say that it proves that groups can only overcome this tribalism uh, when a crisis happens, like they ran out of water. 
Um, so never waste a good crisis. Use it to bring people together. Or other people admit that groups um, can only come together around a common enemy when there's something that they can all hate together. There's nothing that can change that. And so as we look at our world today and as we look at churches, I wonder if we're, it feels like we we're kind of in an experiment like that as well. And I mentioned, I, I titled this a murderous shibboleth. And obviously from Judges chapter 12, I mean, that was, that was a matter of life and death. And so you might be thinking, well, I mean, the issues that we have today, they're not murderous. It's not a matter of life and death. And, and yes, I agree, they probably aren't. But, but if we're including things into the gospel that, should, that aren't really part of the gospel, then, and, and if people, uh, if, if they're not considered born again, if they're not considered you know, a real Christian unless they adhere to, to this gospel, then, then what is their what is the fate of their life? And, and then they're, when they die, they are judged and they're, they're going to be spending life in hell. So then that is kind of like a murderous. So that, like, do we really believe that some of these issues that we're disagreeing on are really a matter of life and death? Or, or can it be that there is room for disagreement? And it doesn't matter if you say shibboleth or you say sibboleth. We're still part of the people of God. And so I want to encourage you to think about these things. And one thing I, I want you to, to notice about Judges chapter 12, if your book, your Bibles are still open, and I pointed out to earlier, but in verse, in verse 3, Jephthah said uh, very clearly, it was the Lord who gave us the victory over the Ammonites. Now, why have you come to fight me? And so then now the Gileadites, Jephthah's people, and the Ephraimites are fighting with each other. And in the end, 42,000 of the Ephraimites are killed because they can't pronounce this word properly. But did you notice the Lord's name is not mentioned? It, it, in so many of these battles, it's like, and the Lord handed over you know, their enemies to them, or the Lord granted them success on that day. That is not mentioned in here at all. So it, it seems to be saying, this was not a battle that was sanctioned by the Lord. It, and, and I think so many of our battles, we can ask that same question. Is this a battle that, that God is asking me to fight right now? Is this really, is this really that important? Or, or is it one that we can just be able to agree to disagree on? And I'm not saying we can agree to disagree on everything. We have some, we have some boundaries and it's, it's, it's core. It's the core beliefs. And so here's this, um, saying, and, um, you may have heard it, it comes from church history from some of the amazing theologians in the past around the 1600s. And it was a time of the 30 years war there where politics and religion was involved and people were hating on each other. And some of the church leaders got together and this was a slogan in essentials, unity. Have you heard this before in non-essentials, liberty in all things, charity. So in other words, the things that are essential, let's, let's be unified in that. And I mentioned, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Look that up. This is where Paul says, here is the gospel, plain and simple, what I received. So this gospel was being passed around before Paul wrote Corinthians, probably within a few years of Jesus' death. Here is the gospel that I received, he says, and I'm passing on to you. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 3 and 4. Check that out. It's a saying that goes back older than the New Testament. It's very simple. There's the gospel. This is the essentials that we are unified on. But then in the non-essentials, liberty. In other words, give, give some freedom. There are things that, that maybe are not essential to one's salvation. Maybe they are not essential to the gospel. And so we need to be able to just, okay, let's, let's be a little free here in this area. Understanding that it's, that it's a subsidiary issue. And I'm not saying don't study it and don't have your own views on it. I think that, that you should. And I love talking about those things. But give some freedom in that area. That's, this is in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In other words, in all things, love. Let's be, be loving, whether we're disagreeing or agreeing. And even if it is something that is essential, still we need to be loving. Be, we need to be kind. We need to be able to agree, uh, and we need to be able to disagree agreeably, if that makes sense. We need to be disagree nicely, even if it is something that is essential. But, but this is something that is um, 
being exacerbated, exacerbated, uh, just even within the last four, five, six years. Part of it, yes, is, is, be, is just how social media works, how the internet works. Part of it is just it, it's our culture and we're absorbing these same kinds of attitudes. But why is it that we have to get so angry about these things? This was not a battle that, was, that the Lord wanted to happen. It wasn't one that he, he was calling them to do. This was an infighting among the people of God. That's very clear. In fact, all through Judges, they're, they're fighting the Canaanites and Ammonites, but there's also, as you read it, we only read a few verses today, but there's lots of infighting. The tribes of Israel fight each other. They're not even happy with each other. This is not something that God has ordained, so he wants us to be living as brothers and sisters. So I wanted to challenge you uh, with those words today. Let me just pray as I finish, and, and I'm, I'm going to pray Jesus' words. It's always, you know, if you never know what to pray, you can just use God's words and pray them back to him. And then you know that you're praying uh, according to God's will. So John chapter 17, I read this at the beginning. It's a long prayer, and I'm going to focus on those verses at the end. So will you bow with me? Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us may be one. You know, you and Jesus, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. I pray that you may indwell us, indwell our gatherings, indwell our church, indwell our community so that we also may be unified. Bring complete unity to us. And, and may this unity be a witness to those around us, to those outside the church. They can see that, hey, these people can disagree and still yet do it agreeably. Lord, may those outside the church be drawn to you because of the love, because of the charity we show to one another. And we need your help. That's why I'm praying. Help us to do this. Help us to be wise. Help us to be kind and compassionate. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me remind you of a very helpful tool as we're discerning what are those things that are essential. One of those things that it's hard to disagree on is the Apostles' Creed. It has been around for centuries and some of the smartest theologians at the time put this together and so often we can go back to this and say, do, do you believe in these things? Because this is what we believe in and, and maybe this could be a guide for you to, for you to determine what, what is essential and what is not essential. Definitely, this is some of the very essentials of our faith. And so, a while ago, we created this video where you were reciting the creed. Different, of you, different people of you took turns. So, we're going to show that video, but I don't want you just to watch it. I want you to repeat along with them. And so, you know, it's like, oh, there I am. Or, oh, look at, oh, he's so cute. And think that in your head, but I want you to be saying, the ver don't get distracted. So let us recite the Apostles' Creed together, and then uh, we'll sing uh, this, I believe. And because we're sitting at home now, you can sing as loud as you want, sing out loud, and we'll sing the creed, and then we'll go into our offering time. Oh, I 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Hey, we'd love for you to join us after when this finishes on in our virtual lobby. Uh, so our online host will put up the Zoom link. You can also find it in the notes and, and just click on that link and let's just hang out for a little bit after the service. These words come from Romans chapter 15, verse five and six. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that, Jesus, that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>